Hi, Mel. Thank you so much for joining me today. How are you doing? Good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for being here. Um, I know that we've connected a few times, and so I, I know a little bit about your background, but I know people tuning in might not know you. So can you just tell me a little bit about you and your background? Yeah. Um, I started um, my after like right out of school, I went to art school and wanted to become an art therapist. And then that just kind of led me down a road of becoming clinical professional counselor. Um, and I worked primarily as a therapist in private practice and in hospitals, all kinds of settings for a lot of years, um, about 12 years, I'd say, um, as a counselor. And then uh, God called me to homeschool my kids, which I didn't see coming. And it was just a lot working as a counselor and homeschooling. And so that, that time I kind of went back into uh, my art and was selling, uh, I still do sell um, prints and paintings. Um, and then over the last couple of years, just seeing more and more people uh, struggling with anxiety, especially Christians and not knowing how to get, you know, practical skills, how to trust God in the process. Um, I just have been putting together some resources and kind of stepping out in ministry to help people um, with anxiety so that they can get freedom from fear. And I think that's so amazing because I think that so many times um, as Christians, we don't know really how to talk about anxiety and we don't mm -hmm. know how to help people. So I love that that's your mission and that's what you're doing. But I'd love to talk about, because I think this is what a lot of people don't necessarily understand, is the difference between like a normal level of anxiety and then the like clinical anxiety. Yeah, and that is, that's a continuum. Um, it's kind of how I view it. We have um, anything from concerns to then, you know, fears, worries, um, then anxiety that we might experience uh, day to day or during, you know, stressful times in our lives. Um, stress, because we definitely live in a, a stressful culture. Um, and then um, getting into clinical anxiety. And the major difference there is how um, it affects your functioning. Um, so how it affects your functioning with your family, with your friends, with your work, um, when it starts impacting things that you want to do but can't do because you can't control the anxiety or stop it. And then it gets more into clinical. We see the medical um, symptoms as well, um, just kind of uh, taking over and, and becoming more and more prevalent with, um, you know, issues, breathing issues, sleeping mm -hmm. um, issues, really being able to kind of slow down thoughts um, and then looking at, hey, is there something in the brain chemistry that needs to be addressed? Um, are there, you know, medications, um, you know, nutritional things, vitamin imbalances. So when we look at the clinical, we're really looking at how much is this affecting your everyday life? And um, I think that then it becomes just an all around approach where we can involve counselors, um, maybe a medical practitioner, uh, whether natural or traditional, and then um, also looking at, at the spiritual. And I love that. And I think, um, one of the things that I've noticed is when I first married my husband, um, we didn't know he had a general anxiety disorder. And so anytime he would talk to me about his anxiety, I'd be like, oh, well, I feel anxious about that too. And I'm fine. Um, but it was the way in which it affected our daily lives. And for me, you know, I can process it and go on. And for him, it would affect his sleep and his thought process and, you know, like ignite some fears. And so I love yeah. that you just made that distinction that, you know, there are some normal levels of anxiety that we all have and mm -hmm. that that's normal. Um, but then you can move some of those things into how we process into like, okay, so now you can't even process the anxiety. You can't, you know, go around doing your regular things when it's affecting different parts of your life. So I, I love that we've made that distinction. Um, and then you started talking about some of the ways that, you know, we can help. Maybe we can go into a little bit more specific with some of those tools and resources about helping, whether it's everyday anxiety or even, you know, all the way up to medical. Yeah, I think um, I talk about kind of flipping the focus, um, especially as a Christian, as, as a believer, um, 
when I was in a Christian private practice, even, um, I saw that, you know, the, the main part of, of the therapy and focus is on emotions and, and thoughts. And then there was like a little bit on our bodies, our nutrition, um, and then a tiny bit on the spiritual, um, even in Christian counseling. And I feel like, you know, we kind of need to flip that around, make sure that we're grounded in truth so that when we are able to look at our thoughts and the lies that maybe we're believing, we have truth to to go to um, and looking at our identity in Christ um, and then our bodies, like looking at sleep, nutrition, um, deep breathing, muscle relaxation, and then addressing any chemical imbalances that need to be. And then being able to learn um, traditional, you know, cognitive behavioral approaches um, on really retraining the thoughts and kind of praying through those things and deepening our walk with God as we step out and uh, trust him despite yeah. our emotions, uh, knowing that, you know, he promises to be with us and says, do not fear, do not worry. Um, and so, you know, we can look at that but i think there's a danger especially in the christian world of like just pray about it just trust god um but our bodies god made our bodies in such an awesome way to fight off danger when needed um but when that system gets triggered uh, all the time in our brain chemistry um then you know we can kind of get stuck there and need help physically coming down into that you know rest and digest homeostasis versus staying in fight or flight. And that's where those physical interventions are really helpful to get us to a place where then we can look at, you know, what are, where's our thinking maybe going off of the truth. I love that. And I love that you look at it holistically. Cause I think sometimes even like whether it's Christian community or even sometimes like the medical community, it's very, you know, just medical or just spiritual or just physical. And I love that you've incorporated just all the different ways that they all impact our anxiety and how we deal with it. Um, and I know that you said lots of really great stuff in that statement. So I want to maybe go back a little yeah. bit and uh, talk through it. And I love that you said, you know, like the first thing we can do is, you know, when we're facing a moment of anxiety, if it's just normal anxiety, we can fight that with truth. Mm -hmm. um, but when it's clinical anxiety, it's like we need either medication or practice to get back yeah. into like calm to then go to the remembering truth. <laughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of both. Right. And, and yeah. even when it is a, what we call typical level of anxiety, um, that, you know, deep breathing practices uh, are really helpful to get our bodies kind of calmed down because we all have physical responses to yeah. to fear and anxiety. So a lot of times it's, you know, doing some of those simple things. But if you just tell someone with clinical anxiety to keep doing deep breathing, it's, you know, not always going to be effective and they need help, you know, maybe even temporarily, you know, yeah. to get there. Like the research is that, cognitive behavioral therapy and, you know, traditional therapy and medication are about the same in efficacy, but sometimes people need medication to be able to get to be at a place where their thoughts can stop racing enough to be able to learn those new skills and how to retrain our minds and renew our minds. I mean, God says it's, it's possible, the renewing of our minds. And yeah, for you know, sure. Yeah. And we, I mean, we have lots of anxiety in this house and that's exactly what we've seen. Uh, my oldest daughter has some pretty severe anxiety and for her, um, she goes from trigger to panic with zero space in between, mm -hmm. like go from, and so there's no gap between the trigger and her response. And so we tried kind of doing um, cognitive behavior therapy in that to kind of make the gap larger. Um, but it wasn't helping. And so we did turn to medication, um, which then like made that gap a lot bigger. So then we were able to do some cognitive behavior therapy with her. And so um, she was able to learn those skills because her body was at rest. And so I love that you share that, that sometimes like 
you need to take care of your physical and you know mental state to just bring you to that rest so that you can learn these skills um because yeah we can't learn new things when we're in panic mode <laughs> right right and sometimes it's 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 been interesting too because sometimes like we've seen this in our family um and even with myself like sometimes it's natural things like when your b12 gets really out of whack um that can you know affect your your mental processing your folate supports your um mental processing as well your gut health um has a big impact they've done a lot of research harvard has a huge study out there that on gut health and anxiety um and then uh you know female hormones and so you know all of those things looking at you know getting in balance and figuring out hey do i have something out of balance that's you know, causing me to experience more anxiety than typical. And it's it's really hard when you're in the middle of that panic, right? To think rationally about those things because the prefrontal cortex or, you know, our logic and our reasoning, um, we're not using that part of the brain when we're in um, clinical anxiety or like in panic. It's you're, you're using the amygdala, you're, you, you know, other kind of areas of the brain are at work. And so it, it is so helpful when we have friends or family members that can say, hey, you know what, it seems like maybe your body's off a little bit and can kind of direct us. Um, I know that that's helped for me. That was helpful for me. And, and I've seen that in family and, and um, with clients that I worked with of being able to talk to someone else in their life and get some feedback too. Um, and so I think then when you can say like, okay, I'm having more panic than I used to, or I'm getting more upset than I used to. Uh, Cause when you're in the moment, you don't really notice it because the trigger seems really real and you are completely convinced that that, you know, really negative outcome is going to happen. And so, you know, sometimes it takes, you know, the support of people in our lives. If we, if we have them, if not, you know, a, a counselor, seeing a counselor or, um, you know, a mentor can, can be helpful to kind of like, points in the right direction when our bodies need intervention. I love that because I think, um, you know, you said a few things, which I think it's important to highlight. One, that, you know, there are certain things we can change just in our habits that may help with anxiety. Um, but two, that, you know, unfortunately with anxiety and mental health, that's going to look different for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so what works for me and you might not work for your child or your husband or your friend or whatever that is. And so, uh, you know, what's helped us is we have some really good close family friends that they're walking similar journey. Mm -hmm. And so we get to talk about like, Hey, like how, how are you handling this situation? Or like, Oh, what medication helped for you? Or like, what was the first step that you took? Um, or even I really trained my brain to see like, you know, yellow flags and orange flags and red mm -hmm. flags for my kids and be like, okay, this is obviously not leading us to a healthy way. Can we like, can we change that trigger? Can we make this a little bit less? And that takes time and practice and just intention, which is all sometimes really hard to do. Yeah, it does take practice. And you know, I, I would tell that to clients all the time. It's like you wouldn't show up for a piano concert um, with no practice. And so our bodies um, can create that muscle memory with deep breathing exercises, with muscle relaxation, which I, I like guiding people through of just like going through those muscle groups and slowly tightening and releasing um, visualization. Because what happens over time is that um, then when you're in a anxiety producing, you know, situation, and you start your deep breathing, your body recalls it. And um, they've done this study with heart patients, their blood pressure was able to decrease with when they practice, you know, the muscle relaxation and the deep breathing. Um, and so our bodies are really powerful that way. And, you know, I know when I like, especially like with kids or whatever, when, it, you know, they're, they're triggered or they're upset and you, you tell someone to take a deep breath. Um, usually the reaction is, well, that's not going to change this mom. Like, or, you know, even with clients, like yeah. that doesn't change my circumstances. Um, but you know, it does affect the, the brain centers that are in fight or flight. And it, as soon as we are going into deep breathing, it can activate, you know, those hormones, which help our bodies calm and get back into rest state. So it, it does really work and help. It doesn't change the circumstances. And that's something I want to talk about too, because I think 
um, especially as believers, you know, when we're praying about something that's maybe for years, like maybe we're praying for a job or praying for a yep. loved one or praying for healing. And when we don't, you know, see that, um, what, what I'm so passionate about too, is this, that when we can stand on the truth of the word of God and, yes. and continue to praise God in the midst of it, he brings peace that passes all understanding, right? It's like, just like in Philippians four, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition with Thanksgiving, we present our request to God. And then he gives us this peace that's not connected to our circumstances. And yes. I experienced that in my own life. And so as we're talking about all this, like all the physical and, and the medical and those things that we look at, we also um, have access to the God of the universe who split the seas, who can heal us instantly. Um, and so it's, it's kind of both together. It's looking at these things, learning practical skills, but remembering that we can have peace even when our circumstances don't change. And that's what I want people to hear, that yeah. the Holy Spirit can bring you peace and joy even when your prayers aren't being answered and those things that you might be worried about don't change. And it's as we draw closer to him in praise and reading the word that the Holy Spirit is ushered in with those gifts of the Spirit. I love that. And I think that's so important is that distinction between, you know, he's not going to, you know, the circumstance may not change, yeah. right? His, he has a plan for it, but in that circumstance, he can bring peace. And I know that for myself, um, I know you talked about like when you're triggered and when you're in that panic state to go to deep breathing, I found for me, I've trained my brain to go straight to prayer. And mm -hmm. so it's like, when I feel panic, it's like, I've trained my thoughts to go, okay, Lord, help me to calm down. Um, you know, give me courage to kind of process this feeling right now. Um, and I know that's really helped me, but I know that um, I think what's hard is there's a connection between, you know, like anxiety and mental health and your spiritual walk with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And what I've seen is that like my husband, when he is in panic mode, he doesn't necessarily feel the Lord or really see him in his life because they're so connected. And so I love that you're like, well, you may not feel it. You may still feel panic, but that feeling doesn't change the fact that, you know, the Lord is with us. And that's the truth that we can remind ourselves, like, even yeah. if we don't feel like he's there, the truth is he is. And we can turn that into something that we focus on when we're feeling panicked. Yeah, I, you know, the practice of reading scripture out loud, um, or and having it on a note card, having a verse that, you know, maybe God brings you or is really helpful with anxiety. I have a, um, a free a PDF download, 10 um, Bible verses for Christians with anxiety, and then um, how to use them and how to stop negative spirals. And so I have a worksheet in there with some of these tips and then also how to kind of take truth out of scripture and use that to you know, train your automatic thoughts um, in a different direction. So that's really helpful. But you know, just saying it out loud, even if we don't feel like it, because you're right, in those moments, it's like, I don't feel like praying. I don't feel like writing scripture. And a lot of times when I work with clients, um, especially with depression, it's like, do the things that um, are going to get you towards healing, even if you don't feel like it. So go outside and walk for five minutes and then come back, even if you don't feel like it. You know, when you start doing those things, and this is the same with our spiritual walk, when yeah. we read scripture out loud, we usher that truth in. And the word tells us that, you know, the battle isn't against flesh and blood, but of powers and principalities and forces of this dark world in Ephesians. And, and so we have these spiritual weapons as well to use and to say, hey, there's a spirit of depression. There's a spirit of anxiety kind of hanging over me. And I can take authority over that um, in the spiritual realm, even when my emotions aren't catching up. Totally. And I think as Christians too, it's, it's acknowledging that, you know, yes, we may need medication and we, we may need counseling and we may need to change our diets, all those things. But ultimately we also have the Holy Spirit and the God of the universe yes. to help us 
to train our brains and to show us which truths to focus on. Um, and so, you know, accessing all those tools and knowing that they all exist and that, you know, the balance is going to look different for everybody. So I mm -hmm. love that you have that tool um, and you can, I'll add a link in the show notes. You can opt in for free for that exercise, but maybe you can just share one verse that you have in there that you feel is like a really good weapon against anxiety. Well, I mean, the one I just said, I do love um, from Philippians. Um, I don't, I don't know. Romans 12, two is in there. I know Isaiah 41, 13 is in there that I love, which is for I am the Lord God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear for um, I am, am with you. Um, I will help you. And so this is the God of the universe saying, I'm going to hold your hand like a, like a parent does to a little child uh, when they're scared. And I'm going to walk with you through your fear and anxiety, and I'm going to help you. I mean, that is so powerful that God's saying, no, don't run from me when you're scared. Run to me. I'm going to hold your hands and I'm going to walk you through this. Um, I love is that image so much. And I, I often think of the Lord as, you know, when we say like Abba Father, that's daddy, daddy. Yeah. You know, and so um, just thinking about my kids and how they interact with my husband and you know, it's like, that's the type of the relationship the Lord yeah. wants. And it's just that reminder that, you know, sometimes that anxiety and that depression, we do feel alone, but he is right there. And he, he is happy to hold our hand through it and to, and to be with us, mm -hmm. which I always find is encouraging. Cause I think that's one of the most powerful lies the devil wants to tell us is that yeah. we are alone yes, um, and the Lord is far away. And that's just not the truth. Right. That I mean, that's the, one of the enemy's favorite tools is to isolate, um, to keep us alone. And, um, you know, part of, I think, that helpful therapy, too, in, in writing down, and I work with clients um, with this, and I have this in my, in my course that's upcoming, of how to really retrain those thoughts by writing them down, getting the truth out, and not letting the enemy just, like, have all these lies and, and, and the lie that, like, if anybody knew what I was thinking right now, um, they wouldn't still love me or they wouldn't yeah. want to continue being my friend. And that's just not true. So we need to get those lies out. Even, even you know, just horrible things that we think sometimes get those out um, sometimes on paper and compare them with the truth, a more rational statement. Hey, what does God say about me? Uh, what uh, do I really believe and who do I really want to be? And when we write those things down, we sort of take the power away from the enemy of keeping us isolated with all of that. A hundred percent. And I think a lot of it comes from just knowledge of what is happening to us. Because I know for myself, um, I've gone on this journey this year of discovering I have ADHD. Um, and one of the symptoms is intrusive thoughts. And so I think before I'd have a lot of these intrusive, like intrusive thoughts, and I would feel guilty about them and it start that whole cycle. Yeah. But now that I know it's related to my brain chemistry, I can label those and say, no, that's an intrusive thought. That's not true. And then I can reshift my focus. And so even just the power to know what's happening in my brain, to know that those things don't identify me, that I have the power to then shift has been really helpful for me. So I love that we're talking a lot about like identifying what those lies are or identifying what is happening and then giving people power to say, you know, that's not who you are. Yeah. You can change those things and it might take time and it might take support and all those things, but that change is possible. Definitely. I think you, you make such a good point. I'm just like recognizing some of those things and realizing we're not alone. Um, I work with people looking at cognitive distortions, even that like recognizing black and white thinking or catastrophizing, yeah. um, you know, just should statements. Um, I see that a lot with moms. I'm like, I should do this and I should do that. Um, but when we can recognize that that's what's happening. So we learn about them. And then when we recognize them, then we can address them and also realize like, oh, okay, I'm kind of doing this black and white thinking. Maybe there's a little gray in there. Maybe there's another way of seeing it. 
Um, and I think that's what's so great about the Lord. Um, I, I think Proverbs 3, 4, and 5 and 6, yeah, 5 and 6, um, of just like lean not on your own understanding, you know, in all your ways acknowledge him. Um, and when we're leaning on our own understanding of things, um, it can really, you know, get us to worry and fear because we don't see how this circumstance can resolve. Uh, but God works beyond what we can see. Um, he works in ways we can't even ask or imagine. And so, you know, when, like you're saying, like when we get into prayer in the midst of those moments, we can shift our perspective and start viewing things from a kingdom perspective. For sure. And uh, what I love is I took a lot of psychology in university. And when I read scripture, I see so much of it. Because I think one of the things people do is, well, okay, stop worrying. Well, that doesn't help anybody. <laughs> and when you look at scripture, it doesn't just say stop worrying. It tells us what to do. It says, you know, instead mm -hmm. of worrying, pray. Or instead of thinking about worry, you know, a positive thing. So I think it's that, like, you know, psychology, even now there's been studies saying it's like, telling people to stop doesn't work. You need to replace it with something yeah. else, yeah. you know? And so we've talked a lot about replacing the lies with truth, you know, labeling what is happening in your brain. So you know which weapon to use. And I think we, we don't give enough emphasis on those things, but those are just so powerful. And I know they've helped me and my whole family basically. And so we've really benefited from just, you know, acknowledging what the thoughts are seeing what they are and instead of it leading to more anxiety or fear or guilt saying okay i can then decide to stop thinking about it and to think about something else um and yeah. it's just so helpful and to have that prepared you yes. know like um i talk about like a hurricane kid i live in florida like right trying to um just have those things prepared knowing um what are the weapons that god's given us and when you talked about prayer and we look back at that verse, it's also ha thanksgiving and gratitude praise. I mean, yes. we see that all over the Psalms of just crying out your emotions, um, but I will yet praise him. And they've done studies on prayer and worship and praise that it activates different centers in the brain that actually, um, you know, release hormones that help our um, mood change and our anxiety decrease. Um, they activate centers that want us to connect with other people. So God, this is the God who designed our brains. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a reason he's telling us to praise yeah. and to pray. And we see that with um, the popularity of positive psychology now yes. um, and meditation in traditional, you know, counseling. Now they rec they recommend meditation, which is prayer, basically, yeah. uh, mindfulness, um, you know, gratitude. I, I would often have clients um, write down uh, like three things they're thankful for right before they go to bed. Um, but God knew this because it changes our yeah. brain chemistry. Yeah. So it's just awesome. I know. Every time I see like a study that says something like that, I'm like, oh, great. Scientists like have actually proven what the Lord, what word of God has already told us. Um, but I think it just shows us that like he did create our minds this way and he gives yeah. us those tools. And so when he tells us to be grateful, when he tells us to pray, when he tells us to praise, it's not belittling the situation. It's like, no, these are the tools I've given you to help mm -hmm. you, you know, shift towards me. And I think when we think about it in that way, it's, it's not, um, putting us down. It's actually like lifting us up and giving us what we need to then live our lives the way the Lord wants us to. So I always, yeah, right. when I see those studies, I'm always like, he, 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 we knew this. <laughs> I know. I mean, the brain is so complex. <laughs> Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. they're still trying to figure out all the connections between anxiety and our bodies. Um, but God created us. And yeah, when we can focus on those things that he wants us to do, but then, you know, you look at, you know, throughout the Bible history, we're, we're a stubborn people and, yeah. you know, it just takes that, um, choosing to return to him and to live by, you know, how, what he's calling us to do. For sure. And I think too, you know, like we've talked about that process being different. And I, I have a good friend of mine, what she does is when she's having these feelings, she has an already made playlist of worship music that she will mm -hmm. listen to. 
So she's taking the time to think about what songs are going to help her process these things that are going to help her calm down. Um, and so she's made that list. And so then she just goes and she plays that playlist. And so I love that you talked about preparation. And so a lot of that is like figuring out, you know, I have three kids, they all have different levels of anxiety, but they have different things that help them. So it's not yes. the same process. And so I think that that's important to say, you know, for my son, I don't know why, but like counting really helps him. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll sometimes just count from like backwards from 10 to zero. And um, because it's shifting his brain away from panic, by the time we get to zero, he's doing so much better and we can process things a lot easier. Um, but with my daughters, it's a completely different thing. So I think it's just like sometimes it's trial and error. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and definitely. Sometimes it's like what, what does bring me peace? Is it singing? Is it prayer? Is it you know, what is it that thing that's really going to help you calm down? Right. And with accounting, you bring up an interesting thing because that's um, a left brain activity, right? Emotions are ho housed in our right brain. And so some people do really well with that, like having um, a paper uh, Sudoku book or crossword book, um, because our phones are a whole nother, you know, rabbit hole usually of things. Yeah. But I recommend, you know, when you have, you know, that really can help some people to just mm. calm the emotional flooding enough to like what we were saying, get to be able to then pray, then yeah. praise. Yeah. And so I think, um, so I know we've covered a lot of things and that maybe mm -hmm. if you're listening, you're feeling a little bit lost, but so I just want to recap some things. So I think the first thing is acknowledging that there's a normal level of anxiety that we all process. Yeah. And then there's clinical anxiety and knowing kind of the difference there um, and then also the process of helping us, you know, bring ourselves down into the calm space and then, you know, practicing what's going to help us calm down before we're in a panic. So I hope that makes sense for people. Right. Um, and you can go ahead and you can uh, click the link in the details of this episode to get that free sheet. But I know that you also have a course that you're creating um, to help people even more. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Okay. Yeah. It's called, um, face fear and find freedom. And, um, I just go over a lot of these things that we're talking about, how to really root yourself in the word of God, um, how to look at all the different things in our bodies to make sure that we're, you know, supported for then learning, um, tools that I teach of really how to retrain that thinking, stop those negative thought cycles and, um, be able to learn some new habits, practice some new things, um, and really integrate, you know, the truth of the word of God, the, the, weapons that he's given us along with um the best things that i used over and over with clients from traditional counseling um to really help them so it's really aimed at people that um maybe you don't know if you need counseling maybe you um are in counseling as well and this can just kind of support um you as you want to kind of put those two things together stop um, the negative thought cycles decrease anxiety and be able to trust god more through the process that's awesome. And I think that can help so many people because it sounds like it it looks at, you know, a lot of different factors that people can kind of consider. So I love that you're offering that to people. Um, and we'll add a link to the details here as well so that you can check that out. And I mean, I could talk about anxiety all day, but we've already been here a long time. But I just want to thank you so much for coming on and just having this discussion with me. Um, I know that lots of people hopefully will be encouraged to know that they aren't alone in yeah. their anxiety and that the Lord does give us tools and resources that we can fight back with. Yes, he definitely wants us to have freedom from fear and it's possible. For sure. Well, thank you so much for joining me and we'll say bye for now. Okay, thanks for having me. Okay. Bye. <laughs> bye.